My name is Tisha Betty, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, I am Thaya Houston's Director of Prevention and Training. Um, with a show of hands, how many of y'all have heard of Daya before? Amazing. What do you know about Daya? Um, um, what I learned through the last presentation. Okay. Absolutely. If I had candy, I would give it to you. <laughs> but yes, Daya Houston is a Houston based nonprofit, and our whole mission is to empower survivors of sexual and domestic violence through culturally specific services, which means we have a holistic care system. We speak, you know, 13 different languages on staff. Uh, we build programs to empower survivors to lead an independent life. You know, it's sort of an ongoing program that they go through and we don't have a minimum or maximum time that, you know, survivors are working with us. And um, we have been around for 27 years now, since 1996, same year I was born, so it's kind of cool. Never forget how old Daya is. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of Daya. And today I'm here to talk about the red zone. I don't know how many of y'all have heard of the red zone before. How many of us have? Okay, you were here at the last presentation, so <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Two times um, you're gonna be learning this great information. So the red zone is actually the time from starting now till mid-November that college students, specifically college freshmen and transfer students, are the most susceptible to being sexually assaulted on campus. Um, this is because a lot of y'all are maybe living away from your parents for the first time in your life. There's this newfound independence, you're getting into relationships, you're meeting new people, maybe scrolling through some dating apps. Um, and it is just, you know, as I mentioned, the, the time that folks are the most vulnerable to being assaulted. It's not, it's majority of college freshmen and transfer students, but it's also everyone else in that group. And I will now start on this presentation. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I love stopping in the middle <laughs> of presentations to, oh, okay. So learning objectives, quickly, what is the red zone? I kind of gave y'all a little gist. What is sexual violence? Because I think there's a lot of misconception about what sexual violence really entails. Um, how can you find help and how can you give help? This presentation is really to create a safer campus for y'all. This is for you guys, not to just educate y'all on sexual violence as a whole. Um, I want y'all to be able to lead a very safe and healthy life as you navigate you know, through college. And uh, that is why we have sort of come here together I'll be with y'all for 45 minutes and then I will hand the mic over to Joshua who just left. <laughs> so uh, what is the red zone? Um, it's when more than 50% of campus sexual assaults occur. Um, and I wanna ask y'all, besides the points that I you know, stated earlier, why do you think the statistic is so high for sexual assaults on campus during this time? Yes. Yeah, thank you, what's your name? Iman. Sorry? Iman. Iman said that it's when you're, you're meeting new people, you're, you're sort of navigating this new life, meeting new people, creating new connections, absolutely. And so as I mentioned, the red zone begins mid-August and goes on till mid-November, right around Thanksgiving break when sort of school is dying down, right? Everyone's working on finals, the last leg of midterms. And I will be discussing who's at most risk as well as we go on in this presentation and the impact that COVID has had. How many of us were so tired of being home for like the last three years? I'm sure everyone, right? But that also means maybe a lot of y'all started school when everything is virtual, right? You were, you were in the comfort of your own home and doing online classes. So this might be the first year you're actually on campus and meeting people in real life. And so COVID did have a great effect on the amount of sexual assault cases that were reported on campus because no one was on campus. 
But now that everyone's coming back, um, it is really scary to see what will be happening. So that's why we're here, just to educate and um, help you all learn some tips and tricks to stay safe on campus. So sexual violence has a very broad definition, but the, the most concise way I could put it is um, sexual violence can be known and, uh, as sexual assault or sexual harassment. It includes any forced, coerced, unwanted sexual contact by an intimate partner, that could be your spouse, dating partner, somebody you're getting to know, have been dating for a little while, um, spouse, as I mentioned earlier as well, family member, that's a huge one. Um, family violence is very uh, prevalent in our community as well. A friend, um, a colleague, or even a stranger. And on campus, there's another layer. It could be faculty, administration, maybe a professor. So um, keep that in mind as we go on in this presentation. So it, it's, I've been doing this work. I've been the director over at DIA for three years now, and I often get asked, is this actually sexual violence? So all of the five boxes up there, I have been actually personally asked if that counts as sexual violence. Um, of course, rape does. That is the actual penetration of your body by an object, a genital part, a um, fingers. And then there's attempted rape. A lot of people don't think that's sexual violence because there's this misconception in our community that you have to be penetrated in some form or manner for it to be considered sexual violence. No, it's also the attempt as well. Forced oral sex, once again, same misconception. Sexual harassment is huge. That could mean, I mean, groping, verbal sexual harassment. That could also, that could mean digital sexual harassment. That if you may have shared an intimate picture with somebody that you're just getting to know, and because you're not wanting to sort of further the relationship, they, they harass you and they say, I'm gonna release or the pictures that you've sent to me, post them online and you are being then coerced into staying in that relationship. Um, unwanted touching, it's really, I, get the, I got this question at U of H main campus last time I did this presentation, and somebody asked me a great question, that if you're at a party, which many of y'all might be going to for the first time, uh, what happens if you're walking through and you, you're getting touched? Is that sexual harassment? I always like to say trust your gut. If, a, if it's like somebody just kind of, you know, walking past you, touching you, of course I wouldn't call that sexual harassment. But if you actually feel a grope of some sort, a, like somebody pulling you over to you, that is considered sexual harassment. So I would definitely trust your gut when you're navigating, you know, yourself through larger crowds, new parties, I know I wish I had learned this information when I was in a sorority on campus. <laughs> so this is, I wanted to make this a very interactive presentation. So I have a few scenarios up here. And what I want y'all to do as a group is tell me when consent was, what, when the scenario turned into some sort of sexual violence and why you think the perpetrator, the abuser, the person doing the harassment might think that what they're doing is okay. So the first one states, during a night of partying with your friends, you're pleasantly surprised when you and a new dating partner become increasingly flirtatious. Back at the dorm, you fall asleep next to each other. You are startled awake in the middle of the night by them kissing you with their, hands down, with their hand down your pants. You freeze, not knowing what to do, and then pretend to be asleep. Yes. Oh, okay. Is, you can use Tim's. Yes, yes, I can use that one. So who wants to? Um, I think that when you're, sh oh. I think that when they're startled awake is when like the sexual violence started and maybe the person might be sleep talking so they didn't realize that they 
consented, but it's not consent because they were actually really unconscious. Yeah. So, no, thank you. I didn't ever even consider the fact of like sleep. I'm sorry. Is there an echo? <laughs> I guess I could just. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Okay, um, so I didn't actually think of that. That's a great point that you make. Maybe something that you were doing at night, maybe sleep talking, sleep walking, being half conscious, uh, could have implied um, that you were interested in that sexual activity. But um, that's a, actually, I will think of that as I continue doing this presentation. But what, what exactly, was there any sort of consent when the person put their hands down somebody's pants? No. And why do you think the the person who is sexually, you know, um, assaulting this, you know, survivor, why do you think they thought that what they were doing was okay? Yeah. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> They just assumed that what they did was okay, and also the person uh, that was being assaulted, uh, they were asleep, they were vulnerable, so that was a good opportunity for the perpetrator to go ahead and Ooh. take consent or assume that consent was taken. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Exactly. So just because somebody was flirty with you, just because y'all went on a date and have been hanging out, doesn't automatically give anyone the right to, you know, touch you in an unwanted, uh, at an unwanted time, an unwanted place, especially without your consent. So um, as we're going through the rest of these, I really, I, I want y'all to know that this presentation isn't about saying like, oh, what the, what the perpetrator, what the abuser did is wrong, right? It is wrong. But I also want y'all to be educated on maybe maybe we all think that something is right when it's actually non-consensual. So it's not to point fingers, it's just wholly to educate. So the pandemic has you extremely depressed and your new, medi your new medication and overall mood make you not want to have sex. Your partner of many years say says you should do it anyways because they have needs that should be met. Most nights you go along with it because you want to keep that relationship going strong and sex is a part of that. Yes. It doesn't have to, sex does not have to be a part of a relationship. You don't have to do anything of that sort. Like Absolutely. And so what type of, I guess, coercion did this perpetrator use? I want to hear from this side of the room. <laughs> Emotional manipulation, absolutely. Um, one of the biggest uh, red flags of you, of somebody being in an abusive relationship is actually emotional coercion. Um, a lot of people think abuse is the physical aspects. Yes, it absolutely is. But it's also often emotional, psychological, um, and verbal as well. So this person has used verbal and emotional manipulation to make their partner feel like they have to have sex, especially when their overall mood hasn't been great. They're on a new medication. They're navigating this new, this new you know, reality that they have. So why do you think that the, that the partner who says, um, who is implying that sex is a part of the relationship, why do you think they think that they're doing the right thing by saying that? This one's a tricky one. Even when I put it on the presentation, I was like, hmm. They want their needs met, and maybe they haven't been they haven't been taught that in a relationship there is also this requirement of ongoing consent. That in a relationship it's okay to have moments where you're maybe not physical, and that you know maybe this person has been just influenced by mass media, social media, that when you are in a relationship you do have to have sex. Y'all are so smart. 
Okay, you're eager to have sex as dating was not allowed in your home. Hanging out one night, you learn that a close friend is in the same position. The two of you laugh about this idea of having sex to get it over with. As the night goes on, this idea seems pretty great. You're not in love, but this is someone you trust. While, while having sex, you start to feel strange. You ask your friend to slow down, but they ignore you. After they finish, they apologize, saying it felt too good to slow down in the moment. What's the red flag here? Exactly. So I'm hearing ignoring the, the consent was taken away when they said to slow down. And so why do you think the perpetrator thought that they were in the right or what they did was not sexual violence? Uh huh. Absolutely. So she just said that basically there was an agreement, right? And so maybe there was consent at some point, but once again, to emphasize, consent is ongoing and it's enthusiastic. It's like, it's not like a yeah, okay. It's like an absolute, like, heck yes. Like, I want to do this. And when they said to slow down, slow down, isn't a like isn't a no like you didn't verbally say no but slow down is a no when we're talking about consent this person is saying basically stop use use body language use read between the lines in these moments as well so sexual violence can happen to anyone and there's a lot of misconceptions as i mentioned earlier um, and one of uh, some of the biggest misconceptions are that only women can be sexually assaulted. Uh, men don't get sexually assaulted at all, or if they do, it's a very small percentage. Um, it can never happen to me. I know we all like to believe that we can walk through, you know, downtown Houston at night and be totally safe. We we feel like we can almost take on anything at moments, but it really can happen to anyone at any moment. Um, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, doesn't matter who you're with, how long you've known a person, because we'll discuss that, that sexual assaults do happen most often by people that you know in real, in, for a while and in real life. But over half of women and almost one in three men will experience sexual violence in their lifetimes. And that is just the reported cases that we have the statistics for. Every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. That is absolutely baffling. 25% of domestic violence survivors experience reproductive coercion in some form. And reproductive coercion is when the perpetrator has control over your reproductive rights, your reproductive choices, your reproductive parts, essentially. And eight out of 10 rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. So in movies, I know we've seen the random bad guy harassing the, you know, the actor or actress, um, but in reality, it's often people that are around you and that you know and that you might never suspect you know, being a perpetrator. So how many of us have heard no means no throughout our education in our lifetimes? <laughs> I, I love it because it, it, it is true, no means no, but I feel like it's an outdated version of teaching consent. I went to uh, U of H as well, so I am a Coug myself, and I remember during orientation week, that is what they taught us, that no means no and Cougs get consent, and that was the education that I walked in with in, onto campus. And it, it, it's so great that, you know, University of Houston downtown is inviting us to do this session because it teaches us more about consent because honestly, until I went and, you know, learned about it a little more, I just thought it was between a yes or a no. Uh, but these are the six things that I have learned over time and I'm so happy that we can go over them together. Consent is active and ongoing. Um, as we saw in the previous scenarios, 
Um, sometimes you might want to stop halfway because you're just not feeling it. Or maybe you want to continue, but your partner is, doesn't really want to continue. Um, but it's so important to read body language. Listen to your partner. Listen to whoever you're you know, having sex with in that moment. Um, if they're kind of still, they're not kissing you back, it's probably a safe bet that you probably should stop in that moment. Not probably, you should definitely stop in that moment. But um, really just trusting your gut as the person having sex, whether you know, you're the one who's feeling it or not feeling it. Uh, it is, consent is freely communicating desires and limits. I hear a lot that sometimes it does get awkward to talk to somebody that you're having sex with about what you want and what you don't want. But I really, I really do think that it, it's the best to, to express what your boundaries are, what your desires are, your limits. Sex should be enjoyable for both people, right? It doesn't have to be a. It doesn't have to be this stigma, stigmatized activity like how mass media has made us feel for the last you know few decades. Consent includes boundaries, no matter if you've been married for 40 years or you know been just dating for 40 minutes. Uh, it has boundaries, and of course you grow boundaries as you get to know somebody. Um, you express your boundaries as you get to know somebody, or maybe some of your walls come down as you get to know somebody. But talking about boundaries is so important and um, not just for having a healthy relationship overall, but sexually as well. Like what, what is your hard no? Like what is, what is something that you just don't even want to get into? I know this is a very uh, awkward maybe thing to hear about right now, but I promise it, it's so, it's, amazing to be able to express that, hey, like, I'm never going to do that. Maybe you change your mind. Maybe you don't. Who knows? Uh, consent does not include fear or coercion. If I ask you 10 times to have sex with me, you're going to give in at some point, right? You might be like, oh, my God, I'm so tired of hearing her ask me. And so that's coercion. Um, if I tell you that if you don't have sex with me, I have actually a weapon in the dorm room, you're, you're maybe going to want to have sex with me at that point. But that is coercion. That's fear-based coercion as well. That doesn't mean yes. You might say yes. You might say yes. But that doesn't mean it's an actual yes. That's a coerced yes. Sorry, I just, I love using y'all as example. <laughs> if you're not comfortable me using you as an example, please let me know. Uh, consent lets you feel safe and enjoy sex, as I've mentioned a few times. And it's an enthusiastic yes. Like, it's a heck yes. Not just a, okay, we'll do it. Uh, what consent sounds like? Are you comfortable doing this? You know, are you comfortable right now? Is there anything I can do to make you feel more comfortable? And maybe that is the moment that somebody, you know, uh, is describing what they want and what they don't want. Or maybe they say, hey, maybe we can try next time. I'm really uncomfortable right now. Does this feel okay um, if you go uh, as you are having sex and you're going through this journey with this other person, checking in from time to time? I know it can seem awkward, but it really, it, it should be so normalized to just be like, are you good? Like you, you seem, you know, maybe a little stiff. Like if you want me to stop, we'll stop. Do you want to slow down? Do you want to keep going is one of the best questions. This is the most important slide for all of y'all for college campus safety and just relationship safety overall. Recognizing red flags. Um, no one should pressure you in a relationship, not just about sex, but just pressuring you to go out. Maybe you want to stay in this weekend and your, your partner has pressured you into going out. Um, if they pressure you into going out, um, it can almost be a guarantee that they'll pressure you for other things as well. No one should make you feel guilty. Um, you know, I, I heard that my, my buddy and his girlfriend finally had sex. You and I still haven't had sex. So, like, you know, it just makes me look like a loser. 
guilt tripping you. Accusations. Do you not want to have sex with me because you're having sex with somebody else? Jealousy. Um, you know, you, you when you were at that party or that dinner party with my like me and my friends, and you were talking to someone else. Um, I really, I really didn't like that. You should only be talking to me. I know we've been taught that jealousy is cute in movies, and trust me, I used to think it too. I used to be like, oh my gosh, like so hot when a guy does that. But jealousy is also one of the leading like reasons why relationships also go downhill. Jealousy is a red flag. Some, if there's a lot of jealousy in a relationship, then some of these other red flags might also start popping up. Possessiveness, another one of those things that seems cute when you see it on TV, really not cute in real life. Isolation, oh my gosh. If I ask you, hey, uh, babe, we've, you, you know, I know you have girls night this week. I, don't, I really would love to spend more time with you. Can you cancel this week? You say yes, you say yes. <laughs> And then next week, I'm saying, oh my god, I know you have girls' night again, and I just don't really feel well today. Can you stay home and take care of me? Okay, it's been two times. Third week, I'm just like, you know, girls' night, you're, I heard y'all are going to that one club where I hear like a lot of people dance with each other. I really don't want you going there, so can you just like stay home? Maybe we can go grab dinner. Soon enough, you haven't seen your girlfriends in months. You're the, you haven't seen your family members in months because you know maybe, you're, maybe I have a problem with your family. And then you're isolated. The only person you can depend on is now me. So whatever I tell you to do, you, you're gonna almost, without thinking about it, do it because I am your only support system. This is really, it happens way more than we think it does. Demanding all your time and attention, once again, that goes hand in hand with isolation. Feeling like walking on eggshells. I hate that feeling. I remember, I remember just like, you know, it, there have been like minor moments. Luckily, I've grown up in a very healthy family, but minor moments when my mom would be a little ticked off and I'd be in the kitchen trying to not make any noise and I felt so anxious. I felt like almost throwing up and I hated it. In the same way, in a relationship, if you feel that way, it is probably a, a, a very big red flag for you to either have a discussion with your partner that, hey, you know, I've been feeling like I've been walking on eggshells and I hate that feeling because it makes me feel anxious, it makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong, my mental health is being affected by this, and just having a conversation. And if they don't hear you out, if you feel like you're still walking on eggshells, maybe it's time to reevaluate whether you need to be in that relationship or not. Questioning your sanity, I do this on a daily basis. Uh, trust me, it's very normal. Like, I always am like, am I the crazy one that I think this way? Very normal. But questioning your sanity within a romantic relationship is not good. Um, if you are just thinking like, am I really the bad guy for not wanting to have sex with my partner every night? Am I really the bad guy that I told my boyfriend that, you know, like, I, I don't care to really, like, go out with him and his friends for, like, a double date? Um, never question yourself, because once you start thinking that way, you might feel like you are in the wrong. But once you start questioning your sanity, that's another time to step back and reevaluate. Hurtful comments framed as a joke. I love roasting my friends and anyone that I've dated. I, that is just my personality, but not at their expense. If it's something that the whole group knows about and we can joke about it, like remember that one time Joshua fell down the stairs and it was so funny, that it, it, that's fine. But when it's jokes about personal matters, you know, like, oh, did you hear that one time Tisha's mom had called her in a crisis and ha ha ha, it was so funny. That, but that's personal information that I don't want, you know, out there to other people. And also, if it makes you feel bad about yourself, that if I say like, 
Oh my gosh, look at those pants. Aren't they like, aren't they hideous? And everyone laughs and then all of a sudden the person I went to dinner with is now say, like now feeling terrible about themselves. Controlling what you wear and who you talk to and where we go, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, also, Joshua, let me know when it's time for you to get up here. Uh, controlling what you wear, what, who you talk to, where you go, of course that goes into je jealousy, possessiveness, pretty self-explanatory. Looking through your phone, email, social media, or following you. Uh, I always love to give this example. There's a healthy way to do it. My parents know each other's passwords. They've been married for 33 years. Sometimes my mom will hand my, hit her phone over to my dad and he just keeps scrolling, but he's not doing it in a way to find something. But if I leave my phone out on the nightstand and my boyfriend starts going through it, I will be pretty upset because it, it, why do you not trust me? Is there, uh, is there something that you've noticed recently that you would wanna like find something? Um, there should be no tracking of what you're doing, who you're hanging out with. One thing that's not listed up there is sharing your location. I freaking hate sharing my location with people because my friends are just really funny about it. They'll ask me why I'm going somewhere and I'm like, why, why do you know where I am? <laughs> and then I realize, that they have my location. It's funny, but no one should really be tracking you and what you're doing and what you're posting, who you're following, why you're friends with somebody on Instagram or Facebook. And so now that I've listed all of these red flags, um, I quickly wanna go over how to get help and how to give help. Um, have a trusted support uh, network of family and friends, and especially on campus. You have great staff and administration here that you could go and talk to about what you're facing. If you have uh, even, even like the tiniest, you know, knot in your stomach that the relationship that you're in is unhealthy or maybe you experience something, it's probably the best to talk about it with somebody that you can delegate some sort of responsibility to. Um, and if you don't, maybe you've been isolated, if you don't have that support network, there are organizations like DIA, really trying to name drop the organization I work for, that you can call us on our helpline and it's fully confidential and our helpline advocates will really talk through a situation with you. And if you are in imminent danger, we'll create a safety plan. We do have funding to Uber you to a shelter, Uber you to safety. Um, really make sure that you are taken care of and always, you know, in every single way, pay for your hotel. So we are able to do that. We get funded to do this type of work. Um, just mentioned helplines. Community health clinics, on-campus health services and forensic exams. You can always reach out to the, you know, um, offices on campus to ask them where the Student Health Service Center is. Um, you don't even have to tell them what you're going through. It's just a question. And then when you get to the Student Health Service Center, um, then you can sort of explain what you're going through and you have an added layer of safety because HIPAA exists. But um, there are added layers as well of reporting on campus. So I would highly recommend learning about those. Uh, law enforcement and campus resources. Toolkits and helpful websites. Um, I love this website, it's called loveisrespect.com. I'm 26, I still sometimes go on there just to see like, maybe if I'm, if I'm seeing some type of red flag, I go like read up on it and uh, I, that either confirms that it is a red flag or it helps me learn that maybe sometimes people act certain ways. Your instinct and boundaries, trust your gut, your gut will never steer you wrong. Um, being anxious is one thing. I know sometimes I tell myself that I'm not trusting my gut because it's not actually me being afraid of anything, it's just me being anxious. But then I question my sanity as I mentioned and I say, hey, if you feel this gut feeling, uh, just don't go. And most of the times I've stayed home are the times that, you know, I have been safe and I haven't gotten into any type of dangerous situation. And you, you know, all of the things that I mentioned was if you are going through something, but how do you support a friend or somebody that you know, a coworker, sister, brother, family member? Um, leave out the questions. If I come up to you and I say, hey, 
I was sexually assaulted. Don't ask me what happened. You know, don't push me to say, you know, hey, go to the health service center, get a, get a you know, SANE exam, what we know as rape kits, but get a SANE exam. Um, you can educate me and say, hey, there is a timeline when we can, you know, get swabs and, and, and uh, store them properly, but don't push anyone. Help them find resources. Look up websites like loveisrespect.com, the Dial website, the Crime Stopper website. Um, we have resources on there to help for, for completely, um, I get, just they're all free. I don't know how else to phrase that. They're free and they are there to educate. Honor your boundaries. If you feel like, oh my gosh, I, I just emotionally can't handle helping my friend anymore because it's keeping me up at night. I miss classes a whole day because I've just been helping my friend all day long. Um, it's okay to delegate. It's okay to go up to staff members and say, hey, I can't do this anymore um, because it's 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 hurting me now. So can you please help? Can you can you step up? And 99% of the time they will. Continue checking in with care. It's so important because it's one thing. It's really it's amazing when you're you know somebody refers you over to a certain place, but maybe calling them in a few days just to say hey. Tish, are you feeling okay? I know whatever happened to you was horrible. Let me know if I can do something for you. Or not even do something for you. Just let me know if you ever need to chat. Um, checking in in three weeks, in a month, because assault is a very difficult situation to maneuver through and navigate. And it is a very lengthy process as well if the survivor decides to report it. And keep it confidential. Um, confidentiality is so important. Uh, the statistics, I can't remember the exact number, but um, our clients are at most danger when their confidentiality is released. Um, and that is the time when they either, the abuse gets worse for them or unfortunately they are murdered as well. And so what does support sound like? This, I'll make this my last slide so Joshua can get over here. Um, this isn't your fault and you didn't deserve this. Um, and I believe you. Survivors are not believed and they, they think that they're not believed. They think that people are gonna think what they're telling them is, is, is you know, made up. But saying I believe you is when sort of the floodgates open to the story. Um, I care about you and I'm here to listen and help in any way I can and that you are not alone, that you have a support system here at UHD, that you, you have staff members that care, you have other students that care around you. You might not even know that person, you might just be an active bystander, but just letting somebody know that, hey, I saw what happened and I believe you and if you ever decide to report this, I'll, you know, I'll come in as a witness and that you're not alone. And that was the last slide for me. This is just kind of a putting it all together. I won't go over it because y'all have been great audience, uh, a great audience today and you've been listening attentively. But if you do have any questions, uh, comments or concerns, I do have a lot of our flyers, our pens with our confidential helpline number and my personal business card. Please feel free to email me and uh, thank you so much for being such a great audience today. That's for y'all.